Hi, it's Janice. Here's a summary of Clostridium difficile and our new nurse-driven testing protocol that we'll be implementing in order to help prevent the spread of C. diff infections. C. diff can cause deadly diarrhea. Here are some statistics from the CDC. About half a million illnesses per year are caused by C. diff infections. And of those patients who get C. diff, one in five of those will have it come back. From 2015, almost 15,000 deaths were caused from C. diff each year. Now it's closer to 30,000. C. diff is a gram-positive spore-forming bacteria. Spores from C. diff bacteria are passed in the feces and may persist at room temperature for weeks up to months on surfaces. Who's at risk for this deadly diarrhea? Well, usually those who are taking antibiotics and symptoms start five to ten days after taking the first dose of antibiotics but can occur as soon as the first day all the way up to two months later. Patients who are in healthcare settings or hospitals or nursing homes and then more than 80 percent of C. diff deaths occurred in people that were 65 or older. C. diff spreads easily. Anytime a surface is contaminated with feces from an infected person, we're at risk of touching that surface and transferring those germs. Not washing hands properly after having C. diff on our hands or a patient with C. diff using the bathroom and not washing their hands properly is another way to spread these germs. And then failing to notify other healthcare facilities or different units when a patient with C. diff is transferred from one area to another is another way to spread these germs. What's the best way to prevent C. diff infections? It's to improve the prescribing of antibiotics. It's to make sure that our labs are using the best and most accurate tests in order to identify C. diff. It's to rapidly identify those patients with C. diff and then isolate them. When we're in contact with patients with C. diff, make sure to wear a gown and gloves. And remember, hand sanitizer does not kill C. diff. We have to use soap and water to wash our hands. And finally, clean room surfaces with an EPA-approved spore-killing disinfectant like bleach. A patient with C. diff may complain of the following, abdominal cramping or pain, watery, foul-smelling diarrhea or stools, have a fever, nausea, loss of appetite, and then they could also have an elevated white count of an unknown ideology. In our gut, we have good bacteria like E. coli and lactobacillus, or we can have bad bacteria like Enterococcus and C. diff. Here's an illustration of what happens once C. diff is ingested. You can see that the spores and the vegetative cells are now in the stomach and as they travel through most of those vegetative cells are going to be killed in the stomach but the spores can survive that acidic environment. They travel down into the small bowel where they get exposure to bile acids and then those spores then germinate. Once they're in the colon then C. diff multiplies and the gut mucosa facilitates adherence to the colonic epithelium. Let's blow up what's happening in the colon. So number one over here, the C. diff vegetative cells produce both toxins A and B. And then down over here, number two, this leads to the production of tumor necrosing factor and pro-inflammatory interleukins, which then causes an increased vascular permeability, and then neutrophils and monophils are recruited. Then the epithelial cell junctions start to open up and widen, and then eventually they die, and the connective tissue degrades. Finally, the result is watery diarrhea. Complications of a C. diff infection include toxic megacolon. Here in this picture, you can see how the gut is enlarged, which may lead to a protruding abdomen. Here's what it looks like on x-ray, and here's what it looks like in the OR. Pseudomembranous colitis, perforations of the colon, sepsis, and then again death are also complications of a C. diff infection. Here's a snapshot of the nurse-driven testing protocol. First of all, recognition is key. Taking action is the next step in order to prevent the spread of C. diff infections. Does your patient have diarrhea or unformed stool? If they're a new admission and they've had any episode of diarrhea or unformed stool within 48 hours of admission, then we'll move on to the next step. If they're a hospitalized patient and they've had three or more episodes of diarrhea or unformed stool within a 24-hour period, then we'll move on to the next step. The next step is asking, hmm, does this patient have any other reason for having diarrhea or unformed stools? 
Are they taking laxatives? Have they had a bowel prep? Do they have any underlying disease that would cause their diarrhea? Are they taking stool softeners or do they have a post-op ileus? If the answer is yes, then no testing is required. If the answer is no, then we're going to move on to our next step. The next step is ordering the C. diff test. In the computer, it's going to look like this, C. difficile toxin, quick check, two-step, EIA. EIA stands for enzyme amino assay, and that tests for both of the C. diff toxins A and B. What's great about this test is that we can get the results back within one to four hours. However, it lacks sensitivity. Now remember, this is a nurse order driven test, so a physician's order is not required. Another important point, if a patient has a history of C. diff, but they don't have unformed stools, then this does not require putting them in isolation. The other part of the protocol says that the stool must conform to the shape of the cup. What does that mean? It means that it has to fill the cup and look like almost a liquid. It can't be a solid stool in the cup. As soon as you suspect that the patient has C. diff, start isolation precautions immediately. Make sure to educate the patient and the family and any visitors that are coming to see that patient. Notify the physician and then make sure to document it in the patient's medical record. Here's what the results look like when they come back. Remember, this is a two-step test because no one test is perfect. The first test is looking for the toxins A and B. The second test is looking for GDH. GDH is glutamate dehydrogenase, and that is looking for the antigen that's produced by C. difficile. So if we blow up one of those little vegetative green cells there, the antigen is on that cell. What does an antigen do? I like this picture here. Here you have a giant pink bacteria cell with the little green antigen attached to it, and then you see the brown macrophage saying, I need that. So this is how the body knows to go and start killing the invader. The GDH test is very sensitive. However, it's not very specific. Now, what do we do with these results? So let's say the toxin comes back positive and the GDH comes back positive. Well, then that means your patient has C. diff. Start isolation precautions immediately. What about if the toxin comes back negative, looking for those A and B toxins, and the GDH comes back positive? Remember, Remember, the GDH is looking for the antigen. Then we move on to the next step, which is doing a PCR test or the polymerase chain reaction. Now that test is great because it's rapid, it's very sensitive, however, it's expensive. And then lastly, if the toxin is negative and the GDH is negative, then the patient can be removed from isolation and we continue to monitor them for any unformed stool or diarrhea or any other signs of a possible C. diff infection. C. diff patients require enteric contact precautions. Enteric meaning anything coming from the gut or intestines. So poop precautions or diarrhea precautions. First thing before entering a room or going in to see a patient with C. diff or suspected C. diff is to wash your hands properly. You can use hand sanitizer for this and then make sure to glove up and gown up. Use disposable equipment if possible. Make sure to take off your gloves and gown inside the patient's room and discard them in the trash. Then wash your hands with soap and water. Remember, the alcohol-based hand sanitizers do not kill C. diff. We have to use soap and water and scrub our hands for at least 20 seconds. Lastly, any equipment that needs to be wiped down, use the bleach wipes. After patients left the room, the environmental and equipment cleaning include a terminal clean, make sure to keep the isolation sign up until the terminal cleaning is completed, and then using ultraviolet disinfection. This UV disinfection takes about eight minutes in order to clean an entire room. Treatment options for patients with C. diff infections include antibiotics like vancomycin. Other options are probiotics, which are organisms like other bacteria or yeast, which help restore a healthy balance to the intestinal tract. Fecal microbiota transplants, otherwise known as stool transplants, are another way to treat C. diff infections. Stool transplants restore healthy intestinal bacteria by placing another person or a donor's stool in the colon. Donors are screened for medical conditions, their blood is tested for infections, and their stool is carefully screened for parasites, viruses, and other infections before using it in a stool transplant. Transplant. And then what they do is they put the stool in a blender with saline and they mix it up, run it through strainers and then sometimes coffee filters as well, and then put it into vials or syringes just like you see there. And then that is injected into the patient. In summary, our C. diff nurse driven protocol first includes screening the patient for risk. Do they have a prior history of antibiotic use? 
Are they a skilled nursing facility or long-term acute care resident? Do they have a history of C. diff infections within the past three months? And then recognize the signs and symptoms. Do they have watery, foul-smelling diarrhea? Do they have a fever, nausea, or loss of appetite? Consider any other explanations for the diarrhea prior to testing. Have they been taking laxatives? Have they had bowel prep? Do they have any underlying disease that would cause the diarrhea or loose stool? Have they been taking stool softeners? Initiate enteric precautions. Put the patient in an isolation room. Remember to glove up and gown up and use soap and water to wash your hands after patient contact and then use bleach on any equipment. Lastly, collect that stool sample, make sure it conforms to the cup and send it to the lab stat. Stat being within one hour after obtaining that sample because the toxins break down within two hours at room temperature. So those toxins A and B, if they're left out at room temperature for longer than two hours, that test may come back negative when in actuality it was positive. So make sure you get that sample to the lab as soon as possible. Thanks for listening.